This is C-SPAN's Afterwards podcast. This week, George Mason University professor Justin Guest discusses his book, Majority Minority. He examines six countries that experienced changing demographics in the past and how each responded. The most important thing to recognize is that there's going to be nativism. There's going to be prejudice. Um, prejudice and nativism are a consistent human response to demographic change, particularly approaching a majority-minority milestone. And that's true even in societies that cope really well. He's interviewed by Pew Research Center's Mark Hugo Lopez. Hi, Justin. It's uh, really great to see you, and it's really great to be here on the show with you today. I I know we have a lot to talk about, uh, a lot of really, really interesting things to talk about, and we're going to be talking about your book, uh, Majority Minority. In fact, I wonder if we could first talk a little bit about... um, uh, why you decided to do this book, and uh, with such a, uh, a title, something that's kind of been a little bit of a, of a buzzword in Washington in the last 10 years or so. So what uh, drove you to do the book? You know, Mark, uh, thanks so much for you know, inter- interviewing me. It's so many pieces of my earlier work feels like they came together with this work. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, heretofore I've studied Muslim politics, the politics of a lot of um, minority outgroups, uh, mm-hmm. the politics of, of white working class people and nativism and backlash mm-hmm. to diversity and minorities uh, and nativism. Uh, and I've studied immigration policies, uh, both here in the United States and abroad uh, across 30 different countries. And I think that overshadowing all of these different topics, overshadowing our politics, public opinion, and mm-hmm. our policy has been the specter mm-hmm. of the majority-minority milestone Mm-hmm. The moment when minority groups become uh, become the majority group, they outnumber the original or, or native based um, uh, ethnic or religious minority, yeah. and so I think that you know in acknowledging that shadow cast over all of our politics, I wanted to kind of take it on you know head on. Uh, and for uh, for our viewers, I'm not quite sure everybody might know what majority minority is referring to. But the nation has been under a lot of demographic change. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about the story of where we are today uh, and where the nation may be going in terms of its demographics. Well, Mark, you know better than anyone, really, better than me even, uh, you know, about, about where our nation's demographics are going. But, you know, certainly uh, in the most simplistic, high-level way, um, the country is diversifying, um, dramatically so. It's, it's not the kind of thing that happens overnight. But this was a white colonial settler state at its founding, And steadily over the centuries, we have diversified from the sort of Anglo-Protestant, Northern European Protestant Mm -hmm. basis of our population, along with, of course, a large group of slaves that were present from almost the inception of the country. And that that population has diversified in almost every way possible, whether it's ethnically and religiously, you know, and of course culturally that comes with it. And so what we're now seeing are trends that are pushing us to the point where people who self-identify as white and non-Hispanic white Mm. uh, will no Mm -hmm. longer be at least 50% of the country's population. Mm -hmm. And I'm referring to that, and it's generally referred to as the majority-minority milestone. It's very interesting because uh, the latest 2020 census figures do show just yet even more how diverse a country has become. Uh, About 60% of the nation's population is, as you said, white, non-Hispanic. And I think that's a really important distinction that I want to come back to a little bit later, uh, but also when we talk about this racial and ethnic composition of the country, the other interesting thing I, I find about majority and minority as a concept is we talk about these as mutually exclusive racial and ethnic groups, black non-Hispanics, uh, Asian non-Hispanics, Native Americans who don't have any Hispanic uh, origin, and, mil- and multiracial people who are not Hispanic, Hispanics, and then white non-Hispanics. Not sure the country thinks about itself in that way, but that leads me to my next question, which is really about um, the way you structure the book, which I found absolutely fascinating, um, which is to talk about some examples about what's happening around the world where other countries, other societies have faced this milestone. Um, where did you go? Where did you do some of your research and what did you find? Sure. So many people who think about American politics think that we're exceptional. And in many cases, of course, we are exceptional. We're a very exceptional place. But I think when it comes to the majority minority milestone, um, there was the sense that we we're in sort of new territory, uh, that no country has ever experienced this before, and certainly no large country like us has ever experienced it before. But I think that we can learn from smaller countries that actually have experienced it. Mm-hmm. They act as almost like living laboratories, microcosms of human nature and the changes that take place when demographic change uh, really is, is, is ushered in. 
And so I visited a number of countries, and they're quite diverse, not just, you know, sort of in terms of what ethnic groups you're talking about, mm-hmm. but also what time period and geographically mm-hmm. different. Uh, and as a result, we really can see some, some themes that are threaded through all of them uh, over, the, over the course of history. Um, and so in brief, I study Singapore and Bahrain, which are two, um, uh, by the way, they're all island states, I should mention. In, yes, in, and I like that about that. I thought the island part was a really interesting part. I want to come back to that too, but yes, I'm sorry. Happily, yeah, let's yeah. definitely come back to these island yeah. nations. Um, but they're all island nations, and Singapore and Bahrain are two island nations, uh, obviously in Southeast Asia and, and off the coast of the Arabian Peninsula, respectively, um, that are really characterized by the suppression of mi- minorities. And we can get into that more later if you like. Mauritius and Trinidad and Tobago are islands in the Indian Ocean and the East Caribbean Sea, respect, uh, respectively, um, that are democracies but are consumed and, and gridlocked by ethnic tension. And then third, the third group of countries are New York, which is not a country, although many New Yorkers would like to think that they're a country or would like yeah. to become their own country, yeah. uh, and also Hawaii, which is not its own country today, but it was up until American uh, the American annexation of Hawaii in 1893. And at that time, they were already past the majority-minority milestone. And those two societies, the Hawaiian Kingdom and New York, mm. were had a different type of history. It was, it was subject to a sort of redefinition of, of the identity and therefore a much more peaceful path towards demographic change. Mm-hmm. And so I study all six of these countries, all three different paths, uh, and try to generalize what we can expect and what are the sort of critical junctures uh, in that process. And what should we expect, or what might we expect? Uh, this majority-minority milestone is an interesting, uh, uh, interesting phenomenon happening in the country. It's something that's going to take some time to happen, but we kind of know that it's coming, and it's something that's going to seem to have a lot of potential, a lot of impacts on multiple parts of American life, American political life. But what might we see come from a major- ma- minority-majority milestone in the United States and what you saw in some of these other places? Sure. Well, I think that the most important thing to recognize is that there's going to be nativism. There's going to be prejudice. Um, Prejudice and nativism are a consistent human response to demographic change, particularly approaching a majority-minority milestone. And that's true even in societies that cope really well. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's really important to recognize. It's not something, obviously, to be celebrated. You know, we want to try to mitigate the extent of racism and nativism and prejudice in our societies. But so many people think that we are not going to be able to properly adapt to this demographic change unless we eradicate racism, unless we eradicate nativism. But what Mm -hmm. I find is that actually those sentiments among people who are experiencing this change, that's the turf on which change needs to happen. So majority-minority milestones are effectively governed. Mm -hmm. They are highly subject to the management of governments and civil society and and businesses, how they respond to demographic change really matters because the the, the prejudice is a sort of natural reaction to gross change. Mm -hmm. And so it's about how we cope with that that matters. And so this this is why the story for Singapore is so interesting. Can you talk about how Singapore has managed this transition? Give us a little bit about the history of Singapore, too, uh, because I do think it's one of the interesting uh, examples that you uh, talked about in the book. Well, for the purposes of television, this is such a long story to share, and so I'm going to necessarily, you know, really yeah. uh, truncate it for, for, for our viewers. But um, certainly they can double-click on any of these things by reading the book mm-hmm. and its chapters on Singapore. Um, so Singapore w- is, is an island city-state uh, mm-hmm. at, the, at the very bottom of Southeast Asia. Mm-hmm. And for almost all of its history, it was an integral part of Malaysia, uh, what is now considered Malaysia. Previously the Malay Federation, and previously it was British Malaysia. And... During that period, um, Singapore grew and, and, and into a major commercial metropolis um, that was fueled by immigration, and it was effectively predominated by people of Chinese origin. There are also people of Indian origin, some Westerners, but generally it was predominated by the Chinese. And overnight in 1965, um, not necessarily out of nowhere because there was troubles, but out of almost out of nowhere overnight, um, the Malay Federation, which was recently independent from Britain, uh, seceded effectively. They broke ties with Singapore, leaving the Singaporeans sovereign at their own country, um, but really suddenly, in a way that they had no infrastructure to maintain. But all of a sudden, this Malay city-state became a Chinese-dominated country because of those historic demographics. And so overnight, you had a majority-minority milestone where Malays, previously feeling like they were you know, effectively in control of the territory, were no longer. 
And the, and the Singapore government um, has made incredible strides at trying to create a multiracial society, a multi-ethnic society on this city-state, and to maintain very peaceful relations, mostly for the pur- purposes of prosperity. And in large part, they've been incredibly successful. But to do so, they have invoked a number and passed a number of policies that actually do not overcome race and racial differences, but actually deepen and, and thicken the boundaries, the racial boundaries, inside of their population. They select immigrants based on their racial profiles. They uh, uh, assign people to housing depending on what race they are. And again, it's usually going to be Chinese, Malay, Indian, or other, mm-hmm. what they call CMIO. Uh-huh. And so it's going to be assigned by race. And this is also true for schooling. So it's a society that is actually defined by race, but that has, never actu- but has actually never really experienced much conflict as a result, though. And so through these, uh, through these levers of policy, the Singaporean government has been able to maintain the distribution of the, of the racial and ethnic groups within this population, which I think, if, if I'm correct, around 73% Chinese, for example. Precisely. Yeah. So they have basically frozen the distribution of their population to the distribution that it was in 1965 Very when that majority milestone suddenly took place. Uh, and by contrast, there's the story of Hawaii which is also another island, it was an island nation, uh, not part of the United States. Um, talk a little bit about the Hawaiian uh, uh, majority-minority story, because it's a very different well, set of circumstances, but different set of outcomes. Sure. So, you know, Hawaii, the archipelago of Hawaii, didn't really have contact with anyone outside of Polynesia until the late uh, 18th century. And so, you know, this was a, an island that was isolated. Um, so let alone having a majority-minority milestone driven by immigration. There was no immigration. There, there was no contact until 1778. But after that, after a contact with the British and Americans thereafter, um, the plantation economy began to grow. A lot of white planters established plantations with the consent of the monarchy, and those plantations needed labor. And the Hawaiians were not prepared to actually supply it with labor for two key reasons. One, the population was decimated by an epidemic of a variety of diseases that were coming from Westerners. And then secondly, which really absolutely killed an enormous amount of the population. And then also, many of the remaining Hawaiians did not want to participate in a plantation-based economy. They had historic Mm -hmm. economic norms and norms for how to grow plants Mm -hmm. and and actually participate in a broader community ecosystem um, and natural ecosystem. And they didn't want to participate. And so the regime, the the Hawaiian monarchy, uh, allowed uh, extensive immigration to fuel the labor appetite of these plantation owners uh, beginning in the 19th century. And very quickly, because the Hawaiian population, the native Hawaiian population was so decimated, um, the demographic uh, share of foreigners began to grow. And just before um, the Americans annexed it forcibly, without much blood, Mm -hmm. but forcibly nonetheless, Mm -hmm. Uh, they reached that majority-minority milestone. Interesting. And, uh, and today, uh, Hawaii is a place that is um, the most diverse states, uh, uh, most diverse of states in the United States uh, in terms of its racial and ethnic composition. I think it's the first state, actually, to reach this uh, majority-minority status. There are other states, though, as well, who have re- reached it in recent years. What are those other states? I think it's California. California, Texas, Arizona, Texas, Arizona. I think in New Mexico. And New Mexico. New Mexico is the one where Latinos, I think, are about half of the, of the state's uh, population. Um, so uh, it's also intriguing as you read through these examples and, and, your, and your qualitative work, you're talking with folks uh, in these different places, to see the different levers of policy that are in place to address demography. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that, because usually demographers think about that equation. Okay. That is, uh, what drives uh, populations to go up and go down? Uh, it's natural increase, births minus deaths. It's the arrival of immigrants into a new place. Uh, and uh, there are maybe a few other things that also that might affect the demography of a place. But can you talk a little bit about um, the uh, ability of governments to actually be able to shape demography or maybe their inability to do so? Yeah, I mean, in many ways, you know, demography is, is almost, you know, seems, at least on the outside, uh, to be uncontrollable because mm-hmm. you can't force people to have children, at least. I mean, I would hope no government would do so, um, yes. you know, but, and yet that's very important for a country that yes. children are produced uh, for the sake of population stability. Um, you know, you can't, uh, you can't stop people from intermarrying, uh, which obviously changes the racial composition of a country depending on how people self-identify. Mm-hmm. There are lots of things, uh, and you also can't control when people die, usually. I mean, you can provide government-sponsored health care, uh, and you can 
have you know anti obesity uh, you know pr- uh, initiatives like Michelle mm-hmm. Obama did. Yeah. There's lots of things that governments can do to promote good health. That's right. Uh, but ultimately, you know, if people want to have bad habits uh, and die early, there's only yeah. so much a government can do. Um, but there are some things that governments can do, and they have gotten quite good at it over the years. And I refer to these three ways uh, of controlling demography and demographic change as who comes, who counts, and who connects. And just brief, very briefly on each of these, um, who comes is a matter of immigration. And of course, the state is sovereign when it comes to uh, controlling who is admitted into a country. And governments have become very sophisticated at who they want to admit and who they don't want to admit, even if they're not very effective at always implementing those policies, um, sometimes strategically so. Yeah. Um, who counts is a matter of how much power is given to minority groups, how much power is given to newcomers. Do you give them citizenship? Do you naturalize them and enfranchise them with the right to vote? Um, do you give non-citizens the right to vote municipally, as some cities have now started to do in the United States and extensively in Europe? Um, so who counts really matters. Gerrymandering also affects who is counting. Um, you know, in, you know, electoral institutions like the Electoral College affects who counts. And then finally, who connects relates to the amount of interaction, intergroup contact uh, between a population. And you know, various policies like segregation uh, have an enormous effect on whether a population is actually connecting and creating a sense of social solidarity and, and, and linked fate. So mm-hmm. governments have actually taken a lot of action in responding to demographic change in many ways to compensate for the ways that they can't control it. And uh, the, uh, in terms of the who counts, I found that part of your, of, your, of your framework very, very interesting because it brought to mind a lot of the conversation in 2018, 20, 20, 2019, 2020, about including a citizenship question on the decennial census in 2020. Um, the idea being that uh, who is a U.S. citizen? U.S. citizens are those who are allowed to vote in federal elections. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how this applies to what's happening in America today as we look at our discussion around immigration, around counting people, and about connectedness. Sure. Well, censuses are an in, in immensely important tool, as, of course, anyone from uh, P- the Pew Research Center will, will acknowledge. Um, so, you know, the census is an imperative tool to understanding demographic change, naturally. It's our most important tool. Um, but it also distributes power. It distributes money and resources. And so whether people are counted by the census really matters. And so the initiative to not count, uh, or at least to distinguish between those who are documented Uh, in the United States and not documented would have affected who counts, not only because it could be used to determine who counts, but it also may have suppressed the counting of people who do not have legal status or people who may have legal status but fear deportation anyway, however, Mm -hmm. you know, irrationally. Mm -hmm. And of course, that is exactly what people feared, is that it would have a suppressing effect uh, on people like that. And And, uh, and ultimately affecting perhaps even the count in those states that might then lead to perhaps uh, not getting that additional congressional seat during a reapportionment that, that maybe a state was expecting, like in Arizona. And example. all the resources that come with and it. And the resources. You know, and of course, there's a constitutional debate about who should count, right? You know, that the census, you know, it's, it says in the Constitution that the census will count all persons. Yeah. It doesn't say all legally present persons. It doesn't say, you know, there's no conditions on what type of persons. Um, but we don't talk, count cattle or dogs, but we do count all persons. Yeah. And so, you know, I think that's pretty clear. Um, so there is that legal and constitutional debate. Um, But that aside, there's also the political debate about what the intentions of the Trump administration and their Department of Commerce were. And, Mm -hmm. you know, the consensus is that there was a desire to affect who is counted uh, and to suppress who is counted for political reasons. Um, So thinking about the U.S. story, coming back to the United States and the uh, majority-minority milestone, um, in the book you talk about uh, something that's happened that I think is also a very fascinating part of this, which is that we've been here before. The U.S. has has been at a majority minority milestone before, and the in some ways the country addressed it. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what that was and how it happened. Absolutely, you know the specter of of this majority minority milestone, the one that the Census Bureau has projected for 2044, um, is really majority minority 2.0. Yeah. Uh, you know, it really depends on how we understand whiteness, because who is the majority is a subjective matter. And all countries determine who the majority is in their definitions of the people. And in the 19th century and earlier, the definition of the people in the United States relied on an idea of whiteness that was quite limited in scope, mostly to Northern European Protestants. And so when you have that narrow definition, at least from today's view, a narrow definition, 
Um, we reached a majority minority milestone probably somewhere in the early 20th century or the late 19th, mm -hmm. um, likely probably around like 1910, 1920, because people who were of Greek background or of Jewish background or Italian background, of Irish background, of maybe even of German Catholic background, they wouldn't have counted in that definition of whiteness. And you think about how many Americans today are Italian or Irish right. or, or, or Greek, yeah. it's enormous. Slavs as well wouldn't have counted. And so through those 19th century lenses, the United States has reached a majority minority milestone long before. And that's really, I think, uh uh, interesting part of the story is sort of who counts as white or what is whiteness in 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 the United States today. Um, so today, when we think about this, part of the conversation does revolve around uh, Hispanics in the U.S. And it's an interesting notion the way the Census Bureau counts people. Right? So the Census Bureau asks about race in two ways. Uh, I'm sorry, race and ethnicity in two ways. The first asks people, are you Hispanic or Latino? Uh, and then it asks you, what is your race? Are you white, black, etc.? And they give you this instruction that says. Uh, for the purposes of this race question, uh, Hispanics are not a race. Um, that has had some really interesting outcomes because the 2020 census has shown a lot of really interesting results. But I wonder if you could talk, talk a little bit about this distinction between ethnicity, Hispanic, and race, and how that plays into the majority-minority uh, um, 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 work that you've done in this book. Sure. So, uh, absolutely, those two questions are, are pretty much everything uh, to anyone who studies race and ethnicity in the United States. Um, and the subjectivities of your racial or, or ethnic identity are really present because it is ultimately in the eye of the beholder or the eye of the person with the pen who is actually checking different boxes on the census forms. And so, um, you know, certainly, it, you know, most Latinos uh, self-identify as Latino or Hispanic in this case. Um, but the following question about race is really interesting because... Um, for many Latinos, they feel in the United States as, you know, brown for all intents and, mm -hmm. inten intents and purposes, um, which, of course, is not an option uh, from a racial perspective because, of course, race is itself very constructed. Um, but without that being an option, about 60 percent of U.S. Latinos um, uh, self-identify as white. And so, you know, from the purposes of understanding a majority-minority milestone, it is totally possible that we could see the postponement of that majority-minority milestone if enough white Hispanics self-identify, from a salience perspective, more as white than as Hispanic, um, and, and join for you know, political purposes, as the majority minority, minority milestone matters, um, with the uh, non-Hispanic white group. Um, and this really relates, I think, to your earlier question about the 19th century, because the question is, well, what happened in the 19th century? Because we don't think of ourselves as a majority minority milestone any, uh, or country anymore. And, of course, we are. We already are a majority-minority uh, country. Um, the difference is that we had reconstituted, re-understood what it means to be white in America. And suddenly we extended the understanding of whiteness to those Italians, Irish, Slavs, Jews, Greeks, etc. And so that fundamentally changed the understanding of whiteness and the understanding of what it means to be a mainstream or part of the majority here. And that could happen again. Do you think it's happening again? Uh, I, when I take a look at some of the data for Latinos particularly, you do see, for example, there are some people who might say they have a Hispanic ancestry, but uh, don't self-identify as Hispanic anymore. They might call themselves white all the way. They might admit that they have a, or, or acknowledge the family background, but they don't necessarily call themselves Hispanic anymore. They instead call themselves white. Might that be an indication of where the country is going? Absolutely. It's already happening. So, you know, there are many Latinos, and if people are interested in chatting about this with their friends, they should, you know, uh, who believe that the salience of their white identity uh, is greater than the salience of their Latino identity. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's not a place for judgment, I don't think, actually, because so much of this is in the eye of the beholder. It's how you self-identify, um, not just, you know, who you identify with, but how also you feel identified by others. You know, identity is complex and a two-way street. Uh, and so, yes, it's already happening. Um, and, and we see it affecting our politics as a result. I want to come back to something that's in the, that's in the book that I also found really just a, a very useful way to think about the framing of the ways in which, again, governments might shape um, the national identity of a country. And those are your five pivots. I wonder if you could talk about the five pivots and share with the viewers uh, uh, what those are. Yeah, you know, one of the most critical questions, obviously, for anyone who picks up this book is going to be, okay, so how does a country move towards greater inclusion and peaceful relations? And how do countries move towards more conflict and greater exclusion and less coexistence? Uh, 
And so I want to lay out and, and I designed my research to really uh, identify uh, and pinpoint those critical junctures of how governments move towards inclusion or exclusion. And I call them those five pivots. Mm-hmm. Um, so the five pivots relate to, first, ideology. You know, does a country um, have a sort of overarching theory of like what makes them whole and what makes them together and what makes them a nation? And sometimes those ideologies are very inclusive and sometimes they're mm-hmm. very exclusive. Uh, and again, I'm going to be brief uh, for the purposes of television, but again, this is all you know, extensively yeah. uh, uh, thought through in the book. Um, secondly, uh, there's commerce. Uh, you know, systems of, uh, of commerce can be inclusive or exclusive. You can have a segregated um, uh, labor market where people are not interacting with each other, where professions are segmented by, by race or ethnicity. Um, or you can have a labor market and a, and a commercial uh, a system that facilitates lots of interdependencies where people rely on each other mutually and are placed into contact with people different from them. Yeah. Uh, then there's also culture. So the sports, the arts, uh, you know, literature, cuisine, music, um, you know, all of these are ways to cross divides, to transcend racial and ethnic differences and religious differences um, and be exposed in, in the enriching way that the arts actually does expose us to different cultures and different ways of thinking. But it can also be divisive. And, you know, we see that in the United States. Sometimes the athletic fields are places for controversy. You know, I think of uh, Colin Kaepernick, the quarterback, the former quarterback, uh, from the San Francisco 49ers, mm-hmm. um, who initiated an enormous controversy uh, in, 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 in protesting uh, police brutality against African Americans. Uh, I think about Confederate m- memorials and statues and public works of art that honored the Confederacy and what a, what a lightning um, spark that has been yeah. uh, and rod that has been for, for the United States politics. Um, then fourth, the socialization of youth, education, mm-hmm. uh, how, we, how we teach our children uh, the history of a country. What is our, our, our school curricula like? And, you know, in, it, when I first wrote the book, I think that when people saw early drafts, they're like, you know, this doesn't seem that controversial, you know, off, off the yeah. bat. But then, of course, uh, recent politics in the United States uh, have taken place, and yeah. uh, I think we see just how, uh, how much school curricula can really be a, yeah. a lightning rod as well. Yeah. Um, but schools are also the place for integration. You know, they don't have to be um, segregated and, and so controversial. They're the place where students of different uh, ethnic and religious backgrounds meet. You know, I myself, like I think you, went to majority minority schools in our youths in, in, in Los Angeles, California. Uh, and, and that in many ways presages the changes that, you know, came through in the country, but also exposes us to our, our, our different cohorts, um, which was really special. Uh, and then finally, the politics of threat. Um, how elites and government leaders identify threats to a country, whether they are internal threats, which are very divisive and saying that they're enemies inside of the country, mm-hmm. or whether they're external threats. You know, ideally, you know, it's not another country because that can be divisive too. Um, you know, ideally you have Martians or something like that. Um, <laughs> but, you know, coronavirus was a threat. And uh, unfortunately, that was leveraged for political purposes uh, in the United States. But it just as easily could have been an external threat that unifies a country too. Uh, and uh, this, uh, these five pivots, I think, are all, are all so striking and so interesting because even though some of them may seem like obvious, uh, uh, or some might say that this is a, uh, there's nothing surprising about this, yet this framework I found was very helpful to think about the ways in which the U.S. has reacted to the arrival of over 59 million people since 1965. So just uh, to be clear, in 1965, the U.S. changed its immigration laws, uh, made it easier for folks from many different parts of the world to come into the U.S., and as a result, we've had the arrival of uh, 59 million people since then, uh, about half coming from Latin America, about a quarter coming from Asia, and all together, this, uh, this arrival of many new, new immigrants to the country has reshaped the nation's demographics. It's from this point that we start to see the nation really start to move much more quickly and in a different way, in a different course, towards this majority-minority milestone that we're, that we're talking about. Um, so when I when I think about particularly uh, the ideology part of this, um, I think about um, uh, the ways in which we talk about immigration in the United States today, because there are different narratives about immigration. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about sort of where we are as a country and how we're moving towards inclusion or how we're moving towards exclusion with so many people from other countries living here. Yeah, you know, the natural response to these five pivots is, okay, well, where's the United States right now? Where are we pivoting to? And in many ways, there are such countervailing forces in the United States. I think we're at a crossroads. You know, there are extremely strong currents of coexistence, Mm 
um, the the invigorating effects of of, of race and, and, and ethnic diversity. Um, mm-hmm. You know, people and e- eagerly anticipating demographic change as as creating a sort of equal playing field for a country of of, of immigrants. But there are also many who are discomforted by these changes, and understandably so. You know, the changes are happening quickly, and sometimes people don't feel prepared, or they feel like they don't understand mm-hmm. what's going on, or they're uncertain about what the effect of those changes are on their lives. And as a result, you also have the currents towards nativism, towards backlash, towards exclusivity, uh, and, and that is also present in our politics. Mm-hmm. And so in many ways, I just think that the United States is teetering uh, on this sort of crossroads about which direction to go. And, you know, the result has, not, has been a stalemate at the mm-hmm. national level mm-hmm. um, because how you view demographic change, whether you think it's invigorating and exciting or discomforting and angst-inducing, mm-hmm. really depends, I think, on your politics. And, they, and those politics uh, have become the sort of fulcrum for our political parties. Uh, the Democrats are, you know, shamelessly globalist and cosmopolitan and, 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 and embrace diversity. Republicans are much more skeptical of those processes. They're more nationalistic. They're more nostalgic in their orientation. And so, you know, how you view demographic change has become that pivotal fulcrum. And so what's happened is not that national policy has led. Quite the opposite. What we've seen is that local policies have led. We have seen the mm-hmm. sort of dev- devolution of how to address demographic change down to the municipal or state levels and the vacancy of that space at the national level because of gridlock. Mm-hmm. And so we're likely to see this going forward unless one side is able to sort of tip the scales in their favor. Can you talk a little bit about some of those local examples? Because I do think that that's really interesting to sort of to see how, and this is what I think is an interesting uh, facet of the United States is, a lot of things happen at the local level, at the state level. Oftentimes they may be ahead of what happens at the federal level. But how has this happened at the local level where local communities, states, counties, cities have addressed this change? Gosh, it, examples abound okay. because we have thousands of localities yeah. and so you have thousands of political moves that have been made, yeah. um, all because the national government's not leading or because the local government has the power uh, under mm-hmm. American institutions to resist national trends mm-hmm. and, and dictates. So, you know, you, we've already mentioned a number of these. You know, you think about mm-hmm. municipal voting in certain cities, right? Giving immigrants the power to vote before they actually have citizenship. That's an enormous choice to be made. Um, the critical th- race theory uh, debates and the mm-hmm. effect that they're having on curricula at local school levels mm-hmm. and districts and state schools, statewide school um, the departments of education are making these choices. Uh, I think back to the way that some... Uh, state and and local police uh, uh, forces, police departments, uh, opted out of the Secure Communities program where they were expected to report um, suspicion of undocumented citizens when they arrest people. And some of them said, we're not going to participate in this and we're not going to inform the Department of Homeland Security when we encounter someone who might count. Um, Mm -hmm. You think about like vigilante justice uh, against undocumented immigrants Mm -hmm. uh, in in, in some uh, uh, red states in particular in the United States. Um, all of these are responses to demographic change, either to suppress it, empower it, uh, and affect who counts and who comes in the country. Uh, and it does, uh, one of the questions that sort of jumped in my mind as I was reading the book is, I kept uh, asking myself, is there a tipping point at which we start to see these forces emerge, both the forces of inclusion and the forces of exclusion? Is it when a population, say, becomes, say, 2% uh, foreign-born? What about 5%? Do you have some sense of sort of, is there a tipping point at which all of a sudden the nation or a place starts to really focus on this impending change? So there isn't a sort of magic threshold where, mm-hmm. you know, once mm-hmm. minority groups reach a certain, you know, share of the population, all hell breaks loose, yep. you know, an upheaval yeah. uh, starts. Um, instead, actually, what psychological and political psychological research suggests is that it's more about the pace of change. So it's when the, when, the, when the change is not necessarily taking place, but how fast it happens, mm-hmm. is that when a lot of people begin to feel a, a sense of loss of control. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so much of, of nationalism and nativism and the nostalgia that, that, um, that drives it, uh, I think is about hitting the brakes. It's about giving people a sense of control mm-hmm. over processes that feel uncontrollable. Yeah. And that's true for global processes, but... Uh, you know, as relates to the globalization of commerce or um, uh, you know, uh, climate change uh, or um, uh, uh, you know, currencies and, and trade, but also immigration. It's the social you know, side of, of globalization. 
Uh, and so that's going to be really relevant. But the key here, I think, Mark, is that once the backlash takes place, it's almost always too late. Once the specter of demographic change, of the majority-minority milestone, descends, usually um, the, the, the sort of... Um, the plaster is about to harden, uh, you uh-huh. know, in, in terms of that change ta- uh, taking place. You know, the, the fabric has been dyed. Yeah, as, uh, as one of my demographer friends says, uh, you know, the cake has already been baked. It's yes. all going to happen. It's going to be very hard to change uh, the courses that we're on, uh, just given where we are in terms of the demographics uh, of the country. Uh, thank you for sharing that. I think that that's a really important uh, uh, point to keep in mind about, you know, how the nation is both addressing this in many different ways and what it means, given all the changes that are underway. And, you but, know, Mark, in, in many ways, that was the sort of thought of it, Americans in the early 20th century mm, when mm-hmm. confronted with the first majority-minority milestone, right? They realized that the cake was baked. Mm-hmm. And so what ended up happening was the admission of yeah. what they were then called white ethnics into whiteness, because that was the only way you were going to maintain white supremacy or white superiority mm-hmm. in American society. And so, mm-hmm. you know, those Greeks and you know Irish and Italians, whoever... Yeah who accepted that invitation to whiteness through no fault of their own, but actually participate in the continuing subjugation of African Americans, of Asian Americans, and Latin Americans thereafter, um, which is very much a sort of, you know, strategy uh, for maintaining, you know, white control of the U.S. uh, that had been there since its history. And so, you know, time will tell whether that happens again with the integration of either Hispanics, as we were just Mm -hmm. discussing, uh, or also people of mixed race backgrounds. Right. In fact, that's actually where I wanted to go to next is I wanted you to talk a little bit about this uh, other element of the demography of the country, um, the growing number of people who are either marrying somebody who's not of the same race or ethnicity, and also children who are uh, the children of parents who are of two different races or ethnicities. Uh, what is happening in terms of trends there, and what does that mean for this majority-minority milestone? Well, it means a lot because... It's very, you know, the majority minority milestones only drive conflict where the barriers, the 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 draw, the sort of boundaries of race and ethnicity and religion are thick, right? When they're being transcended, coexistence can take place, right? And and the sense of linked fate can develop where you feel like we're all the same. Um, when people are marrying uh, uh, partners who are different from them, or producing children with partners who are different from them, they are embodying the mm-hmm. transcendence of these boundaries. You know, they are actually producing human beings mm-hmm. for whom these lines don't matter. And mm-hmm. so that is actually a really powerful way to disarm and deactivate the really divisive politics of exclusivity and, and, and demographic change. And uh, today, uh, uh, something like 40% of all interracial, interethnic marriages are uh, a white, non-Hispanic per spouse with a Hispanic spouse. Uh, and most uh, intermarriages are a white, non-Hispanic spouse with somebody who's not white, non-Hispanic. 80%. 80%. Uh, and uh, when you take a look at the intermarriage rates of the two largest immigrant groups of the country, those who say are of Hispanic origin, you'll find that, for example, uh, about uh, 28% of uh, Hispanic newlyweds marry in any given year marry somebody who's not Hispanic. And similarly for Asian Americans, almost 30%. So when we're talking about the future of the country, it is striking how much the two largest immigrant groups uh, or populations that have a lot of immigrants in their populations are all are in the forefront of some of this, uh, some of the intermarriage changes that are underway. Absolutely. And, you know, th- these numbers are coming, um, at least from my side, uh, directly from great work by a sociologist named Richard Alba, uh, who has studied this really extensively. And that matters, you know, that, that you have this kind of intermarriage rate. Intermarriage and, and mixed-race people... Uh, skyrocketed 300% over the last 10 years, according Mm -hmm. to the Census Bureau. Mm -hmm. And so this is a trend that's going to continue. But when those mixed marriages and when those um, mixed-race individuals are predominantly, at least some share, white, the question is whether they will embrace that whiteness as the most salient part part of their identity uh, or embrace the minority group more. And, of course, there, are a, there is a pretty strong incentive in many cases socially to embrace whiteness because of the advantages, the structural advantages still associated with whiteness in the United States. Um, but the, the best way around all these politics is to just stop making whiteness the sort of center uh, of, of what it means to be an American in the first place. You know, that's the real crux of all this, is that race still matters in American society in meaningful economic, social, and political ways. And only when that stops will these kinds of identity choices cease to matter so much. Um, but as long as they do, people are going to be concerned 
about the racial distribution of the population and what the demographic change holds. And what that implies for politics in the country. Uh, that leads to another really great part of the book, which is your own research, uh, the experiments that you do with messages and some of the survey work that you did as well. Can you talk a little bit about uh, what it is that you did in the book to explore um, some of the ways in which, for example, people's attitudes about uh, race, identity, nationalism might be um, impacted by the messages that they hear from leaders? Sure. So, so much of these ideas come from my work in the field. So, I'm a, I'm a real field researcher by by training and, and by by passion. I love that about you. Yeah. Uh, you know, and so you know, going to the various societies that I studied was just so exciting. Um, but it was also so informative mm-hmm. uh, because it, it allowed me to sort of develop hypotheses uh, about how to actually navigate these changes and what's mm-hmm. what's done well and and how we might be able to adopt some of those moves here in the United States and. You know, the two hypotheses that I was really most interested in um, relate to the politics of nationalism. They relate to how we convince people um, who are really nationalistic or fearful of that change. We talked about them earlier. Mm -hmm. um, uh, To actually embrace demographic change or to at least not be so unnerved by it. You know, you don't have to love it, but you certainly... But the key here towards coexistence is to not make people feel like there's an existential threat posed by minority groups and demographic change. And so what I want to do is to test two things. One is, is it possible that when people are informed about uh, immigration uh, and, and uh, advocating you know, more liberal views towards immigration that would mm-hmm. facilitate greater coexistence but also the admission of people to the country going forward, if they're told about these ideas by a familiar face, by someone who actually aligns with them politically but also ethnically and racially, mm-hmm. um, would that actually make a difference to what they think? And so I experimented um, using white male conservative uh, messengers. And the short of it is the effect was, was there. Uh, it, it moved people, it nudged conservatives in the United States towards a more liberal attitude towards immigration when it was advocated by someone that they knew. Mm-hmm. The other thing that we tried was to actually inform people about how immigration is actually the most nationalist thing you, you can allow. Uh, that instead of actually immigration being a national threat, a threat to the, con- to the constitution of the nation, it's actually the way to sustain the nation. Uh, and so we put together some statistics uh, for a variety of European countries, actually, not in the United States, um, for 19 different European countries. And in each country, we inform people about just how fast their countries were aging and how this has going to have really detrimental effects on their economies and on their societies going forward unless immigration is allowed. And to our surprise, this demographic argument from a very nationalist perspective about the survival of the nation uh, mm-hmm. was powerful. And it moved people marginally but significantly towards more liberal views, even people who are conservative. And so I think that nationalism, what this teaches us, is that nationalism is not something that we have to, you know, that we should be just constantly lamenting as this vile, foul, uh, you know, sort of zeitgeist of our politics today. Um, rather, it's almost a sort of human condition. People want to be proud of their country, and they want for it to survive. And so framing demographic change and immigration in a way that embraces its role in the survival of a country is actually the way forward. And up until now, we've been so focused on the humanitarian case posed by immigrants um, or mm-hmm. the sort of commoditizing them as an, as an economic agent. Mm-hmm. Um, and it hasn't been very successful to sort of disarming our politics but the evidence suggests that actually treating it as the most nationalist thing you can want is actually a good thing. Uh, and you just took away one of my questions, which is going to be about immigration and the ways in which we talk about immigration in the United States and actually globally. Um, but I, also, I want to come back to the, to the messaging and the testing that you did, uh, because you also had some examples of real-life experiences or real-life impacts of where there had been some changes in the messaging that was coming from um, uh, U.S. leaders around something. I wonder if you could talk about an example of where this has happened in real life, where we've seen uh, um, a leader talk about a change in the way they think about immigration, and that may have impacted the ways in which uh, the public thinks about immigration. Sure. Uh, you know, I think that, you know, if we want a U.S. example, um, you know, you don't need to look much further than just recent history, because, you know, up until Donald Trump took the helm of the Republican Party, um, you know, most mainline Republicans were very pro-immigration mm-hmm. for business purposes yes. in most cases, from a labor perspective. Um, you know, uh, John McCain, um, you know, Mitt Romney, uh, 
these were the presidential nominees. George W. Bush, presidents, and, and, and his father um, were all Republicans uh, who not only embraced immigration but actually sought it out. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, the, the first attempts at, or the uh, most recent attempts, I should say, uh, at uh, comprehensive immigration reform were thanks to enormous amounts of Republican support. And there were some actually on the far left who didn't want it. Um, and so it was really a centrist, liberal view, uh, sort of in a capital L liberal view, mm-hmm. um, that, uh, um, that, that folks wanted immigration. Um, but when the party leadership turned to Donald Trump and he embraced immigration as a really powerful mobilization tool, um, Republicans sort of followed um, because they followed the, 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 the trusted Republican leader and um, the rest is history. Uh, you know, immigration and anti-immigrant sentiment um, is now, I would say, the, the sort of um, core uh, of, of republicanism in the United States, but also of the far right in Europe as well. Um, you know, this is the, the sine qua non of, of, of right-wing politics today. Um, but, you know, in the, in the cases that I studied, we see similar effects of elite leadership, uh, of elite rhetoric. Um, you know, Lee Kuan Yew was uh, the longtime leader of Singapore, um, and he embraced a multiracial society, and he constantly talked about the Singapore story as one that was effectively race-blind. But in his public comments, he also mm-hmm. made very sure to, to assert Chinese supremacy mm-hmm. on the, on the city-state. Um, and so those, those statements mattered. Uh, in Trinidad and Tobago, um, their two principal political parties are racialized. Mm-hmm. The UNC, the United National Congress, is predominantly of Indian origin, uh, while the PNM, the People's National Movement, is predominantly of African origin. And they assert those identities uh, on a day-to-day basis and therefore reinforce their salience in daily Trinidadian society. Uh, so interesting. And uh, uh, thank you for talking about those, uh, those, uh, those uh, non-U.S. examples, because I do think that this is not, this is not just a U.S. phenomena. But you're absolutely right that we've seen some real examples in the U.S. of where the uh, leadership on immigration reform has sometimes come from uh, Republican leaders like George Bush in 2004 and, and so forth. Um, but, you know, also on the Democratic side, unions yes. were previously quite skeptical That's of immigration, right? Yes. right? Yeah, yeah. And they all had to fall into line on the mm-hmm. left when immigration just became, you know, universally embraced. And it was basically in politics to even question whether you would, you know, admit more people. Yeah. Um, I think detrimentally so, uh, because it suggested that there was almost an out-of-control approach to immigration on the left that was been really, that's really hurt Democrats politically. Yeah, exactly. And uh, it's, uh, you know, it's also interesting to see this in contrast to where we are in public opinion. So in terms of public opinion, and this is also one of the one of the pieces that I found really fascinating about the book, is your discussion about the ways in which uh, immigration policy advocates, or advocates for policy change in immigration in the immigration space, um, have tried various ways to talk about why immigration is good for the country. And you mentioned it already as commoditization of immigrants. Immigrants are workers. They're committed to do things that Americans don't want to do. Uh, also, that it's a, it's a humanitarian story. This is just the right thing to do. Um, and that certainly is a, a, a narrative that has permeated the world in terms of the discussion today around immigration reform and what countries should do. Um, but yet, when you take a look at Pew, uh, Pew Research Center surveys, you'll see, for example, that the public has shifted in its views on immigrants. Uh, back in the 1990s, um, most Americans would have said immigrants are a burden to the country. They're not good Absolutely. for the United States. Today, though, it's a different story. Uh, the majority of Americans say that immigrants strengthen the United States. Americans also say diversity makes the country a better place, and they like diversity in their, in their communities and in their workspaces. You also find that uh, Americans are of the view that uh, they show some sympathy or have some sympathy for the challenges that undocumented immigrants face in the country. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about this, what seems to be the American public, even Republicans, moving towards a more accepting view of immigrants and yet we continue to have the conversations around immigration and nativism that we do today. Yeah, and you know, these majorities that you're talking about that have moved towards a more liberal view of, immigra- of immigration um, are, are significant majorities. You know, we're talking 60% in some cases, yeah. even more. Yeah. Um, you know, I think about uh, the, the creating legal pathways for undocumented people who, right. who um, came over as childhood arrivals. And, you know, that's almost 70%, I think, of the country now. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. that supports that. Um, so these are significant majorities. Why are our politics deadlocked? It's because of the intensity differences in these views. So the 60 or you know, two-thirds of the country that support more liberal priorities uh, towards immigration or at least see immigration as a universal good thing for the country, um, for them, immigration is you know, 
maybe like the 10th most, most important issue in the right. country That's today. Right. They're yeah. more focused on the economy, on inequality, on climate change, on the accessibility of health care, mm-hmm. on racial justice. Mm-hmm. They've got other priorities right now. But for the one-third of the country, and sometimes even smaller share of the country, um, that is concerned about immigration, that is discomforted by it, that's anxious about it, that feels mm-hmm. like it's out of control, it's like the number one issue for many of them. And if it's not number one, maybe number two or three. And so that intensity gap between Americans as it relates to immigration is what's driving this deadlock Mm -hmm. because Republicans don't feel like they have the bandwidth, the representation, uh, the bandwidth to actually violate it because it's such a virulent uh, sense of, of fear associated with immigration. And Democrats don't have the same amount of passion behind immigration. The best case scenario, I think, for... Um, facilitating greater immigration in the country is to basically just turn down the volume, Uh, you know, to make people care less about it. Um, You know, our country needs it for our national survival. Point blank. It's very simple. Um, But Democrats, I think, also have to uh, give people the sense of management, of control over the system. Because what makes people so scared and discomforted is the sense that the United States may lose control over its borders or may not even have it to begin with. And that Democrats aren't interested in asserting discretion about who they let in. Yeah. It's, uh, it's very interesting, which uh, uh, you know, we're getting close to the end here, but I wanted to talk a little bit about what is one of the key takeaways from the book that you would like to share with our viewers? Because uh, the last chapter of your book, I think, is really just a great, uh, something I encourage everybody to take a look at. If you're going to look at something, look about the first, at the beginning and the end. But the uh, American prospect, where are we going to go? What is going to happen uh, in the coming years, uh, what do you think the chances are for the United States to uh, uh, address this majority minority milestone? Uh, will we succeed? So I think, and maybe naturally, I think that this is the greatest social challenge that confronts the United States today. And that's probably also true for countries that have a more distant horizon for a majority mm-hmm. minority milestone, mm-hmm. like Canada or Australia, um, or even potentially the, Brit- the Britain, the United Kingdom at some point. Um, I think this is the greatest social challenge that we face. And when we face social challenges, um, governments, business, civil society step up and they identify it and they put resources towards addressing it. And so if we want for our country to have coexistence, if we care about greater inclusion, we actually have to invest in it. We Mm -hmm. have to invest time, energy, creativity, resources. Mm -hmm. And right now, there is no senior aid at the White House, there is no legislative aid in Congress tasked with con- con- uh, conceiving strategies for mm-hmm. embracing demographic change and comforting people and bringing the country, ushering in new change. There mm-hmm. are no people who are sort of diversity czars, you know, mm-hmm. or coexistence czars out mm-hmm. there. Mm-hmm. Um, and so if this is something that we believe to be a challenge, and if people recognize that this is the fulcrum of our political division, our polarization today, then we need to actually exert effort into addressing it. And that's not something that we've done so far, which is lamentable on the one hand, but on the other hand, it gives me some optimism because it suggests maybe if we actually were to put our minds to it, we could actually overcome the nasty politics that this has created. And uh, one of the other things I think it's also interesting here is uh, how the nation has engaged in a very deep, very contentious, and very tough conversation around race and racial justice uh, with George Floyd's murder two years ago uh, and also just what COVID-19 has brought to the country. Um, I know that uh, it's, it's always hard to be current and everything in something like, like a, as, as massive a project as your book, but could you talk a little bit about the role of uh, black Americans in this story about majority, minority, the milestone, and where we are today? Because certainly the focus has shifted really towards racial justice, income inequality, in a way that uh, it's a much deeper conversation than it was, uh, say, 10 years ago. But it's been building, and 2020 really exploded on the scene. Could you talk a little bit about that and how that plays into the majority-minority story? Absolutely. Look, on the surface, black Americans, African Americans, um, fit into the majority-minority story because they're part of that plurality Mm -hmm. of people of minority backgrounds, people of color, as they're often called, in the United States. And so the majority-minority milestone depends on the significant share of Americans who are black. Um, Now, that's just on the surface. But you dig just slightly below the surface, and you realize just how complicated things are. Mm -hmm. Because not uh, not as many uh, blacks in the United States um, recognize their own immigrant heritage. Their immigration was forced in nature. 
uh, in, in terms of their ancestry. And, you know, in, in terms of new African or arrivals, um, you don't always have the same sense of solidarity with them that a Latino might see with a new Latino arrival. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, for someone who, like your family, is more here multi, multiple generations, mm-hmm. you know, you may recognize more quickly someone who's a newer arrival. Mm-hmm. Um, but even beyond that, there's still a lot of prejudice among minority group, ethnic minority groups who are non-African American mm-hmm. to or towards African Americans. Yes. You don't have the sense of sort of pan-racial solidarity that majority minority milestones, the idea of it sort of suggests, mm. right? Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, and so those prejudices against black people amongst Asian Americans or, or Latinos in some cases um, mirror the prejudice that we have measured among white Americans. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, it, it is not this perfect fit uh, into the same story uh, here. And that's something that has to be acknowledged. Um, but that's also true of all the various minority groups, they are all very different groups of people. Yes. And, you know, it's easy to talk about them as like a monolith, as we have so far in our conversation, yeah. uh, and generalize so broadly. But, of course, underneath these headings of Latino or Asian comes yeah. enormous heterogeneity, diversity of religious background, culture, racial identification. Political thought. Absolutely, and yeah. education. Yeah. And so, you know, these, these complexities are America. We're a complex place. Yeah. And we are still yeah. changing, we're still evolving, and you know the, the various ways um, our identities intersect uh, are pivotal to our politics, and I, and I hope the book, the book uh, you know, shines a little light on those. Uh, well, uh, Justin, it's been a real pleasure to get a chance to chat with you about the book. We didn't get a chance to talk about Latinos in the upcoming election and, the, and how they seem to be shifting towards the Republican Party, but I encourage our viewers to read the book because there's so much in here that's it's so rich and deep and so much around what's happening in the country today. And I, I like the perspective that you bring to talking about demographic change, that it's not something that's apart from policy, that can actually be something that is part of our policy conversation as well. So, uh, Justin Guest, thank you for being with us here today. It's a real pleasure, and uh, thank you. The pleasure is mine. Thanks, Mark. Thanks. Thanks for listening to this week's Afterwards podcast. If you enjoyed this podcast, listen to C-SPAN's podcast about books. Learn about the latest nonfiction books and best-selling authors. In each episode, we report on bestsellers lists and book reviews from around the country. You'll also hear authors talking about their latest books and insider interviews with nonfiction book publishing industry experts. 